All right. Hey, folks, welcome to today's episode of the Concealed Carry Podcast. Uh, I'm going to kick it off officially here momentarily. Obviously, I have a guest with me whom I will introduce officially here in a moment. Uh, but we always give folks a chance to pop in and start catching the feed before we start talking about the good stuff. So, um, yeah. Well, for those that are just watching the live feed, so Dave, in case you, I didn't explain this to you, uh, we will hit a point here in about three minutes where I'll say we're beginning the official recording of the podcast. Okay. And 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 we will do that right now. We're just chatting with the folks on Facebook and YouTube. So anyway, right, we've, cool. we've got super Dave Harrington with us. Again, we'll introduce him officially when we record the podcast. But how you doing, Dave? Uh, just fine, Raleigh. I appreciate the uh, opportunity, man. And um, I think we've got an interesting conversation already started, man. I agree. I'm anxious to continue it. <laughs> good, good. Well, hopefully that gets people excited. Uh, no, seriously, uh, uh, Dave and I, we talked on the phone a few weeks back. And the way that conversation went was like opening layers within my brain so uh i know that you've got some really good stuff to throw out there brother so looking forward to it for sure okay. so we have a few folks watching now we have our first comments coming in hello randy from smoky socal uh the whole west is practically on fire dave so yeah although well, we certainly don't have to worry about that where i'm at man yeah the uh we're into our set your afternoon watch by the pounding thunderstorms every day. Uh, it's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. But, uh, it's, you know, typical time of the year for us here. Yeah. I hate it for them out there, but man, you know, what are you going to do? For sure. For sure. Well, we just got hit actually with a snowstorm two days ago, a day and a half ago, which hopefully Where are you again? I'm in Colorado. Yeah, Denver, right? Something yep. like that. Yeah. Wow. Although that's very unusual. Normally, we might see the first flakes in middle of October. Well, does so, that tell you anything, man? What kind of winter it's going to be this year if it's already... <laughs> I know, right? It, it, who wow. knows? It's 2020. You know, Nobody can guess what's next around the corner the, in a crazy year like 2020. <laughs> right, no doubt, man. It's been a... <laughs> Interesting one for me, for sure. Yeah, brother. My year started with my house getting electrocuted. Uh, then I had wow. my hip replaced in February. Then uh, I totaled my truck. Mm. You know, ad infinitum, man. It just, <laughs> it never a dull moment. <laughs> oh, never boy. Never a dull moment. Yeah. Well, I think we got enough folks popping in, so we'll go ahead and begin the recorded portion of the show. So, this is how it goes. I'm going to give a countdown. I will do the podcast show intro, a brief sponsor message, and then we'll go right into it, Dave. All right. In three, two, one. This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, episode number 444. And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network. I am your host, Riley Bowman. And today I've got a special guest on our show whom I will introduce formally here momentarily. And we've got a lot of great content to cover. So I'm going to jump right into a quick sponsor message. Sponsor of today's episode is none other than our members only group. The place for like-minded individuals that are doing their best to prepare and get ready for whatever fight may come. Hopefully it never comes, but you never know when that day may come. And so Guardian Nation, Guardian Nation is the place where those that want to, again, spend time with like-minded individuals, get access to our members-only content, videos, uh, uh, all kinds of great stuff behind the paywall at guardiannation.com. That's, that's the place to go. So hope to see you there. Uh, we've got a great community of folks. So go to guardiannation.com to learn more, get signed up. And uh, yeah, everyone, we got Guardian Nation members watching this episode or listening to this episode today. So 
Uh, they seem to all like it, and we like them. So GuardianNation.com. All right. There's a sponsor message. Uh, a little bit unusual uh, to, to rush through everything, but again, I'm super excited to get into this episode with our special guest. Today, we have uh, Super Dave Harrington. Uh, he is He's the man, all right? I've, I've enjoyed my interactions and conversations with Dave in, uh, in recent history. Uh, not too long ago, we were talking on the phone about some really interesting stuff uh, that I, that I thoroughly enjoyed and said, dude, like we got to put this on the podcast because, uh, I think people are going to really enjoy this. Uh, Dave, you know, for folks that don't know who you are and you might just throw a little bit out there, but you're, uh, you were in, in, you were in the army for a long time. Actually, I, I, I just watched a video from you or about you yesterday, uh, on trigger time TV, uh, and didn't know that you first enlisted in the Navy then you got right. out. Then you went to the Air Force, right? Uh, and then you transferred uh, interagency to the U.S. Army, and then had the opportunity to go through, uh, uh, you know, to, to go through training to become Special Forces, uh, right. become a Ranger, and all that. Spent the rest of your career in Special Forces in the U.S. Army, and also instructing and teaching uh, at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare School in Fort Bragg. So, Correct. Dude, you've got quite a quite a history, quite a career, and uh, did I miss anything? Yeah, but who's counting, man? No big deal. Uh, I've had a good run at it. Um, I'm I consider myself fortunate to um, you know have had the opportunities and stuff that I've had in the past. Uh, but more importantly. Um, I want to reference, you know, the question that I brought up that we had all, you know, we were having just prior. Um, what is the measure of skill? Yep. Right. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly how it came about, but, you know, having asked you, your initial response was very telling to me because it was kind of like you didn't really know how to answer the question. You know what I mean? You didn't know what. uh you didn't have a frame of reference or you didn't understand what I was asking for a uh, frame of reference. Right. But see, <clears throat> that's one of the most important aspects. You know, what we were going to discuss today was the uh, natural skill progression uh, aspects, various aspects of natural skill progression. Mm -hmm. But check this out. You know, everybody initially starts with, you know, having had guidance, you know, legitimate guidance uh, for myself. It was my father, I think, when I was like four or five years old, uh, shoot a 22 uh, Smith and Wesson 22 32 kit gun uh, rolling a Coke can. The um, but at what point in your learning curve? do you establish a consistent level of performance? Now, I'm not talking about skill level. I'm talking about a simple, consistent level of performance, mm. right? Because one of the most important aspects that I think people need to take into consideration is, you know, you always hear the buzzwords, master the fundamentals or master the basics, uh, fundamental this, fundamental that. And frankly, the fundamentals are what you need to know and understand, you know, comprehend and be able to do. Right. That's one side of it. Mm -hmm. The other side is. At what point? Are you standing there having made the decision to deliver a shot with, let's just say, a modern combat handgun? We'll call it a Glock. Sure. You make a decision to deliver a well-aimed, well-placed shot. What are you actually thinking about while you're firing? Mm. Are you standing there mentally cycling through a list of fundamentals and cross checking your inputs or are you having already 
known and understand the material, what you need to apply, are you mentally focusing on what you should be doing while you're doing it, evaluating it, cross-checking it by making adjustments while you're executing it? Mm. Because uh, <clears throat> I'll simplify this in a manner of speaking. To my knowledge, there's eight fundamentals. And it's very, it's a sequential list, very detailed information goes with each respective fundamental. However, that's a lot of material to be cycling through mentally. When I'm firing, I'm focused on what I'm doing in real time. Right. But primarily what I'm thinking about is what I have to do in real time. I have to stabilize the weapon with the target in respect to all things aiming. I need to be doing that as well mm -hmm. in respect to my physical interaction with the pistol. I'm evaluating my inputs in respect to pressures and all things concerned. But the key is I have to learn how to do these th three aspects of stabilization, aiming, and applying physical action to make it go bang or firing simultaneously. Knowing that, it puts emphasis on timing. So I like to simplify things in real time when I, when I start explaining what it is you should be doing in real time, which is being aware of your self-aware, not just mentally, but physically aware, uh, you know, what is your level of mental and physical coordination? What is your level of mental and physical synchronization? Check this out. Um, I accelerated beyond coordination to synchronization just to put emphasis on one aspect. Normally when you you know, you train, you learn, and you practice, and you prepare. When you execute, the normal construct is you make a decision, X amount of time transpires before the initiation of action, or you could continue to measure that time frame through the end of the completion of the action. You follow me? Mm-hmm. But in respect to the decision, the time that transpires between the decision and the action, you have absolutely trained and conditioned yourself that when you make the decision, the decision is the action. You eliminate that time lag, so to speak. Right. And that allows you to make decisions in real time. But again, it's based on your level of awareness. So dig this. Everybody's needed guidance or a coach or lessons, however you want to describe that. <clears throat> and there is, you know, an element, uh, regardless of your knowledge and experience of continuing education, um, because there are different levels of understanding in respect to ability, right? So dig this. Hmm. Timing is a critical principle. So looking at it principally, you have to stabilize the weapon with the target. All things concerned. Let's take a look at that real quick. What is your physical orientation to the target? You understand what I mean? Uh, where is the target in relationship to you? Uh, what is the terrain like? Are you above the target, below the target? Uh, can you, at best, can you get a oblique angle to the, you know, to, to the target? Um, what are all things concerned in respect to stabilizing the weapon or getting the weapon oriented properly with the target? Whatever your aiming tools are, you apply what you know. But one of the most simplest things that makes your average shooter actually can make an average shooter an exceptional shooter is the simple ability to judge distance, right? Well, in support of judging distance, 
you have to do what I refer to as the basic shooting math. Uh, size and distance to the target, uh, lighting conditions at the target, lighting conditions at the firing position, color contrast of the target with its background, you know, can you see it? Uh, color contrast of the target with the sighting tools you're using. Um, the elements, you know, weather conditions. Um, but more importantly, do you know your zero? Do you know what that intersection is? Do you know what your near zero is? Do you know what your far zero is? And can you accurately estimate range and do the calculation in respect to where you need to aim in order to hit the target, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you, it takes much longer to describe it than it is to actually do it. Very cool. But um, do you, what are you thinking while you're firing? How aware are you? Because see, my level of awareness right now, uh, mental and physical coordination, awareness, uh, Part of my mind is focused on what I need to be doing for the shooting piece. Part of my mind is focused on evaluating how well my gun and my equipment is running. Um, you know, you can compart you can begin to compartmentalize and pay attention, you know, multitask and pay attention to virtually everything that's taking place mm -hmm. and systematically prioritize it. But at the same time, through all phases of your training and practice, put emphasis on remaining calm. See, mm -hmm. to an extent, everybody, you know, I, I I still get excited when I pack my gear to go to the range because I love shooting. It's cool, man. It's like energy. It's, you know, power. It's uh, fun. But um, well, how much emphasis does an individual place on remaining calm? Because see, when you start, whether you realize it or not, that's adrenaline you're feeling, man. It's just like going to a major shooting event, dude. You know yeah. what I mean? You have to learn how to control adrenaline and make it work to your advantage. You know, sharpen senses uh, to an extent, increased endurance. Um but you learn how to control it and use it to your advantage instead of, you know, like get match butterflies and feel like you got to go puke before the buzzer goes off for your first course fire. Um, okay. Have you got all that? That was yeah. kind of a huge preface for what I'm about to say. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. How self aware are you? Because dig this, man, here's what I actually, in my experience, I have seen, experienced and, and seen happen. Once an individual becomes self-aware, I kind of see it like this. Establishing a consistent level of performance is critical, you know, course of action, one. Then, two become self-aware because with self-awareness comes the intuitive ability to do what? That's a question, dude. You, you, you can, uh, here, here's what I'm seeing or what and I'm self critique. Yeah. What I'm hearing from you is that ability that if you are aware enough, if you're dialed into what you're doing, what's taking place, the inputs you're putting into the pistol, uh, then you, you need to make, you can make those corrections on the fly more exactly. easily. Exactly. Right. That's like telling yourself, uh, okay, well for a strict marksmanship exercise, um, in which I'm firing on a static target, a known target at a known distance, um, pretty easy, right? Right. You're going to make a decision about what you need to see in respect to your sight picture. And that's what you're going to want to see before you break the shot. Right? Yep. Would you agree with that? I agree. Okay, cool. Now tell yourself you're, you're prepped and ready to shoot a, let's say a field course at a major event, right? Mm -hmm. 32 round field course. 
are you going to tell yourself before the buzzer goes off, you, you're going to only see one sight picture for that entire course of fire? No. One type of sight picture. You see what I mean? Did you have all kinds of different targets, different distances, different, different distances, different targets size or, or, or available target area, high, low percentage targets. Exactly, man. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but see, the key is coming back to the skill progression part of it. Once you can establish a consistent level of performance, then your performance becomes measurable. You see what I mean? Yeah. But what's your, what are you using, you know, for a ruler? You know, there's all kinds of, um, I'm not even going to get into the CCW type requirements and all that. I mean, you know, that's basically showing people somebody that you can safely load, fire and unload and clear a, a pistol. That's cool. You need mm -hmm. to know how to do that stuff. But um, uh, generally, people think they're uh, a lot better than what they actually are because there's really no um, general rule of thumb as to what is good. And, and it's kind of a very, it would be a very fluid conversation to even visit it because I mean, USPSA and IDPA are very small organizations comparative to the national population that, you know, can legally participate in that type of event. Right. Right. But what is the percentage of the, you know, the national population, it's, you know, a pinprick. It's not, there's not like a national standard of gun handling tasks, skills, um, even organizations, your law enforcement and military organizations, uh, the world over, look how much their um, environments vary and their standards vary. Um, you know, there's a pecking order, so to speak. Uh, the higher you go, the more stringent the standards are. And, but there's really no good start point for your average bear. So what is, you know, what is good? It, it, you know, you don't have to be um, a 50 yard bullseye shooter to pick up a pistol and kill somebody if you need to, you know, as long as you're within your uh, rules of engagement uh, and you're willing to do it, you're committed to do it. Uh, not that difficult. However, it's a very fluid environment. What, kind of shooting do you want to be good at you know there's precision shooting there's uh or you can refer to it as marksmanship and combat marksmanship right mm -hmm. there's um what do you want to accomplish from a marksman standpoint the working relationship i want to uh give you some input on clarifying the working relationship uh, between marksmanship and combat marksmanship, okay? Marksmanship equals the ability of an individual to apply the principles of marksmanship to a firearm and produce a consistent shot group. Now, that's kind of a vanilla definition for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, that definition, can, you can overlay that definition on virtually any type of firearm. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Uh, you just got to do the math on what, is principally required to fire it effectively. <clears throat> Combat marksmanship equals the ability of an individual to deliver fast, accurate, and lethal fire on the enemy without hesitation in adverse conditions within the rules of engagement. You mm -hmm. see what I mean? It's not right. the same animal. It, it's kind of like talking about how I mean, I can have a real shoddy grip, for instance, on my pistol if I'm just shooting bullseyes at 50. But to do what you're talking about, combat marksmanship, 
to be able to do so quickly and accurately, effectively, lethally, all that. I've got to, I got to have more than a, just a, I, I got to actually be really gripping the again. Yep. Uh, being a combat marksman, an effective combat marksman, uh, emphasis, so much emphasis is put on, um, you know, a high standard of marksmanship ability mm -hmm. because that's what the environment is going to require of your skill. You follow me? Plus, yep. you're working in very compressed time frames. Um, you know, you have to have positive threat identification. Uh, you can be the most accomplished shooter on the face of the planet, do something stupid and get rolled up anyway. Yep. You know what I mean? There's no making sense out of combat. Right. But what I was trying to point out is it's kind of a parasitic relationship. If, if you're not a marksman, how can you expect yourself to acquire combat marksmanship mm -hmm. ability. Right. You have to be a marksman. You have to be a good shooter. There's um, any number. There's a few programs that I offer that, you know, I make it pretty clear right up front. You know, I expect you to be able to shoot when you get here, you know, because when you do, when first thing we're going to do, I'll shake you down on the pistol, shake you down on the carbine, shake you down on some integrated aspects of it. And once I've done that and made, you know, made an individual and collective assessment of the crew, I'll select my start point and go to work. <clears throat> and, you know, again, people's idea or, you know, thoughts in respect to what they're actually capable of performing there. There's kind of a, a huge gap there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But you can't um, hold it against them because, you know, what is the balance of life uh, where that individual lives? There may not be a range facility that is flexible enough to allow them to actually perform the type of tasks they need to practice, learn and practice. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of shooters struggle with that actually. Unfortunately. They have, yeah. It's, it's uh, pretty sad. Yeah. But the legal system has had that, you know, uh, detrimental effect on, you know, public ranges, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I actually was doing kind of a, favor for a friend of mine, a consult thing on a facility over in Orlando. And when I walked in the door, uh, the manager did was like, I stopped to look at the range rules, right. Uh, that were printed on, a. it was very nicely done, man, but it was like a four by eight sheet of plywood. Mm. That was like, I mean, it had a complete list four by eight sheet the plywood list of rules. He goes, well, what do you think about that? I'm like, well, it's nicely done, dude, but nobody's going to read that. <laughs> if you're going to read that, you'd have to stand here for 15, 20 minutes. Nobody's going to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, good effort, but you know, I don't think it was thought through that far, yep. but um, you got a lot of rules, man. And people aren't here to read a rule book, man. They want to, you know, rent some guns and ammo and, do a little blasting, get a kick out of it and head out. But, you know, the range staff has got to backstop the facility, the rules and all that. But uh, right. you can't put it on the individual to stand there, you know, and expect them to know that when they're just there for 30 minutes. But it's the balance of life, you know. Um, people, for example, expect me to shoot well. Doesn't matter. What, where I'm at or what I'm doing, people expect me to do well. And they should expect me to do well because this is what I do. I mean, it's like, is my job. So I should be good at it, right? Whereas I have the time, energy, and resources to put into it. You see what I mean? Yep. Whereas uh, I know a lot of guys that uh, are switched on but their life's balance of their marriage and family and work doesn't allow them, you know, 
an equal amount of training opportunities. So it's amazing that um, people are able to do the things they can do, um, mm -hmm. but they've got to, um, I think people need to stop trying to do too much at one time. You know what I mean? I've mm -hmm. got, to, I've got to do a little bit of everything. So therefore I'm not really good at any one thing. Kind of the jack of all trades, master on none syndrome. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, you don't have to have, uh, you know, a book full of uh, fancy schmancy logistics intensive courses of fire uh, work on the best thing that I could recommend to anyone, regardless of your uh, training opportunity. Do some strict marksmanship work first. Then you want to do some combat related firing tasks. Cool. But end on strict marksmanship exercises. Because mm -hmm. the bottom line is no matter, look at it this way. In the marksmanship environment, let's just say, imagine in your mind's eye the best possible sight picture you could have for a 25 yard uh, bullseye, right? You got to know what that is, but you also have to know what the ability is to consistently deliver that type of shot. Because in the combat marksmanship round, pretty much unless you're forced to deliver a precision headshot, you're going to be working with less than a perfect sight picture um, at all times. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Right. I may not need to... I don't know how this is going to sound, but, you know, I, I may not need to see the sights. The decision point is I don't need to, I don't need anything more than a visual impression of the sights for the time speed distance problem I'm solving right now. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm still using them, but it's how much. Right. Or I mean, if, if you're, at all. particularly if you're on a, on a up close target or your target's relatively large, I mean, if you're, if your sights or your gun never deviates outside of the acceptable hit area, you don't need much at all. Right. But how do you learn that at speed? You mm -hmm. see what I mean? Yep. Well, the only way you can learn that at speed is learn by doing at speed. And that's where the disconnect happens. Uh, because if you truly don't know what it is, or understand what you're trying to accomplish, then you're not really going to know how to go about doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, the professional level of training and guidance comes in, you know, you seek that out and you capture it, but come in full circle off of several different tangents. Um, I want to put emphasis on, you know, the actual topic of skill progression and how that happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So we talked about first establishing a consistent level of performance, then establishing self-awareness, uh, mental, physical awareness of, you know, what you're doing while you're knowing what you're doing while you're doing it, being able to pay attention to what you're doing while you're doing it, evaluate, make adjustments as you go. Timing is huge. Okay. Absolute timing is huge. Principles, uh, stabilization, aiming, firing, and timing. Um, timing can be interchangeable. Uh, you've always got to stabilize the firearm. You've got to aim it. But you also may have to time the shot. You may have to time the shot due to many different reasons. Uh, the available uh, stabilization that you have. Uh, is it a static or a moving target? If it's a moving target, what's its uh, speed or rate of movement? Um, what caliber are you firing? Uh, does the caliber that you're firing in relationship to a moving target re require you to lead the target at all? You know, there's a lot of um, factors that come into the play of the problem. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is, is, 
the human mind can intuitively solve so many problems, you know, at a time. Um, and people are actually doing these things. They may not be aware they're doing it, but they are actually doing it if they're firing these types of exercises successfully. You follow me? Mm -hmm. That's where the level of performance comes in. You may not know or understand why it is you can accomplish task X, but you can accomplish task X. The next aspect of that is understanding, you know, how you can do it by increasing your level of self-awareness. But once you become self-aware, you should intuitively be able to develop the ability to self-critique. Now, here's the danger zone, dude. Um, we all have a tendency to be hypercritical of ourselves, of our performance. Somewhere in there, and, and there's no magic pill to solving that problem. Um, you just got to learn how to deal with it. It, but if you are too hard on yourself, if you never throw yourself a bone or cut yourself some slack, um, you're going to wind up inadvertently allowing every mistake you make to eat you alive, get under your right. skin. And you can't, you know, that's something that uh, I learned very early on uh, firing competitively in the, in the mid 90s. Uh, I, I literally had no room for error. Here, here's the scenario. Um, it was the advent of the double stack, you know, the double column 45s of the fat guns, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Clock 21, for instance. Exactly. Well, I was told, you know, I was firing uh, LAV custom and I was told that I could not make master firing a single stack 1911 uh, in USPSA. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, dude, that was like pouring gas on a fire to put it out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> here we go. And I did, I did. It was a performance match thing, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, I made master, uh, firing single stack 1911. Of course I was using Wilson 10 round max, but big deal. 11 rounds in the gun. Mm -hmm. Um, what I had done unknowingly at the time by making the decision to achieve that goal. I put myself in a position where I couldn't, even though I was firing major, I could not afford to drop shots at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I virtually shot round tight period all the time. Well, in order, because my, mental position at the time was if I can fire a fast AC, why not just fire two fast A's? You know what I mean? I didn't, I couldn't do the math on right. I, I never really was uh, into the slucky boy math and analytics and all that. I just kind of, you know, showed up and what's course fire. Okay, cool. Let's shoot it. Right. Good work. But uh, you know, I admire those guys for their mental game, mm -hmm. and um, you know they're just professional athletes, man. Well, uh, when you're running a limited capacity firearm, uh, I think some of what you're kind of getting at is you got to make every every shot count. You don't have the opportunity, so, I guess, that some exactly. of the shooters might have to make a lot of makeup shots, for instance. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but the, um, there's so many moving parts to the whole thing though, but I would, uh, I would break it down <coughs> in a manner in which, excuse me, give me a sip of water here. I would break it down in a uh, matter of establishing a consistent level of performance. Now what that measuring stick is, I'd be careful with that. Pick a good one. Um, and then start working on, you know, your level of awareness. Mm -hmm. And it might be, you might be aware, you might just not know it. Um, I, I think that's where I was for a long time, to be honest with you. Here's how you do it, man. Mm -hmm. Here's the, here's the key to the castle, so to speak. Mm. Let's say, uh, 
you set up, you know, a firing exercise and, and you fired extremely well. You know, you're, you fired successfully. Well, what do you do? What do you do at that, in that moment that you realize that you just pulled it off and were successful? What do you do? Oh, that's a question. Well, I, I think, I mean, number one, I, I'm real big about recording things, so I should record. Hey. Yeah, but how do you do it? Uh, well, in the old days, paper. Now, these days, I keep everything on my phone or in an app. Oh, okay, you're talking about shooting video. Okay. Video, well, video about, that's true, too. Yeah, video is a great, uh, great record keeper. Absolutely. I'm talking about mentally, dude. Here's, here's what I'm talking about. Sure. I deliver a successful shot or, you know, uh, complete a successful exercise. Uh, the moment I realize that, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the time and put emphasis on powers of recall, okay, mm. immediate recall. And I'm systematically going to go to the start point and cycle through, in my mind's eye, cycle through everything that I was seeing, thinking, and feeling that allowed me to perform well mm. and acknowledge it and log it. Yep. Because I see what you're getting at. Yeah. Those are the same things that I am going to replicate for my next action. I'm going to do it again. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're achieving a couple you're double tapping yourself, so to speak. If you take the time to do a mental review, as I just described, that enables you to develop in a level, you know, the level of awareness required. There's a level of awareness required just to do what I'm asking you to do. Do a mental review of everything that you were seeing, thinking, and feeling that allowed you to perform well. It's awareness. It's applied awareness. Do that. Um, it's like a debrief, man. Mm -hmm. Debrief yourself after a successful action. If I crash and burn something, I'm not putting that one iota of energy into a crash and burn run. No reason to. I crashed and burned it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't. I know what happened. Yep. Um, this is one of those, I guess you'd call it a pet peeve, but dig this, man. You're a firearms instructor in your own right, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Have you? How do you dig on the answer? I don't know. Have you ever asked somebody, hey, man, what do you got going on there, dude? Yep. I don't know. Hey, what are you doing, man? You know, you do that little inquiry. Right. I don't know. You know, they, all, they almost look like they got caught, you know. Sure. It, it blows my mind, man. Maybe it's just me. People say uh, I can be intimidating at times, but dig this, man. Nine times out of ten, I'm just in, I'm just curious as to what you got going on there, man. You know, you might have done something cool that I've never seen done before, you mm -hmm. know. Maybe I want to know what the why is behind it. Yeah. But um, I don't know. That's. I, I think that creates a, an opportunity as an instructor to uh, to dig a little bit more because e either that, that person was standing there. That type of response. What's that? When you get that response. Is right. That what you mean? Okay. Because, Go ahead. Because, because I think that. Um, it's, it's good. I think it's healthy for us as instructors to help the student discover, uh, what they do know or what they experienced, uh, because unless they were standing there like a zombie, just right. slamming the trigger and, and not aware of anything, you know, and, and if that's the case, then they shouldn't even be on that firing line to begin with. Well, hang on, um, dude, hang on. This is, uh, I got to interject on that point, man. Sure. I agree with you to an extent, but what is the target audience you're working with? No, uh, you see what I mean? Right. No, I, I, no, but to, to clarify what I said, stated a moment, uh, you know, a moment ago is just that what I'm, what I'm saying is if they truly don't know what they're doing oh, because, yeah, yeah. because they're not, uh, they're not engaged. They're not paying attention. They're right. they're mentally they're not there. Yeah. Like that. That's that's potentially a, you know that's a whole other issue. That's yeah. You know we're not yeah, being how, they, how they get that far. What's that? Kind of like uh, in support of what you're saying. The question in my mind was would be like, how did you get this far, dude? <laughs> right. Right. 
you know, you got that right. going on and you made it this far. Right. There's a, so something uh, up. I was just going to say, so assuming that they're not like totally mentally checked out, mm -hmm. uh, then, then I see that as an opportunity to ask some probing questions to help them discover on their own, yeah, right. you know, how, how they just did what they did. Well, there's, yeah, there's time, um, there's time and place for all of it, man. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I may be running one program, but I'm actually executing, you know, 10 different classes mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, I feel it's important to, uh, well, one, it's different for everybody. I don't care what you say, what you do. Uh, nobody is the same. Nobody has the same size hands, reflexes, vision, physicality. You know, shooting is unique to the individual you know, what they know and understand. Uh, a lot of people don't like to get into the realm of uh, mental capacity, uh, mental agility, uh, and those types of adjectives uh, in respect to describing someone's performance because I guess, you know, they get their feelings hurt or some crap like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, in in the performance realm, if you, this is so easy to understand, man, that's the cool thing about it. Uh, in the performance oriented realm of anything, doing anything performance oriented, um, the performance itself takes care of all that, man. You don't run into that type of goings on. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, because the performance is what's important. You it's on you to know and understand what it is you need to be able to do in order to meet that goal or achieve that goal. But there is one critical aspect we haven't shined any light on yet. And uh, even though we've spoke about timing in several different instances, it takes time, especially, you know, what is your life's balance? How much time, energy and resources can you commit to training and practice and achieve your goals in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? That's kind of where um, coming tying in that point about people expecting too much out of themselves, you know, being hypercritical, you know, I've, man, I've got to be able to do this, uh, you know, whatever, you know, sub second task and, you know, at best, it can probably be done in a second. You know, people's awareness of time or time awareness in respect to what they are capable of performing in a given time frame suffers greatly as well. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, this it's actually kind of comical when this happens, man. I get a kick out of it every time it does. Uh, I'll ask somebody, okay, for this type of task, you know, during a gig, during a program for this task, how long, you know, do I need to do it? And they're like, uh, you know, it might be like a four or five second task. And they're like, uh, 1.2. I'm like, whoa, dude, you need to come up here and demo that, bro. Cause <laughs> I can't do that, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you should be up here, man. I'll, I'll go out there in the pile. But, uh, Yeah time awareness and what are you capable of performing within a given time frame? That's going to set you up for success. Uh, well, as you well know, um, or should know breaking down a course of fire, how are you going to, you know, develop your shoot plan for the course of fire and still leave yourself enough mental flexibility to deal with things in real time. Like, you know, when things obviously aren't going well, Right. Uh, Something falls off, you know, yeah, the, you have the fall off the somewhere. agility, the mental flexibility to uh, uh, compensate and still turn in a good, a strong finish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people talk about competition, you know, the, you have the, like the tactic guys, tactical guys and, uh, you know, the gamer guys, whatever the bottom line is, my, in my observation and experience, 
uh, shooting competitively is the perfect skill development environment, period. Mm. It's, it's an opportunity for you to apply what you know, freestyle or in whatever manner, it's a shooting problem that you're not going to be afforded an opportunity to do in a like manner anywhere else. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, I do. Uh, I, I enjoy it for that very reason because it, it is a unique biggest, challenge that presented. Is the biggest benefit that I see is developing mental agility man developing the ability to think on your feet at speed and problem solve hmm. uh, that is the highest uh value that i've gotten out of uh you know competitive shooting and you know amongst other things but i would say that was the the hbt or the high value target Overall, man, I know it's kind of been fast and furious, man, but um, skill progression. Uh, do you have anything, you know, do you have any questions of me based on, you know, what I put out there? Yeah. So have I it, it, any questions in your well, mind? If we were going to uh, summarize uh, some of what we've covered, I'm trying to put this back, you know, I'm trying to put myself back in my shoes say 20 years ago as a relatively inexperienced, you know, raw shooter, um, you know, if we were having this conversation, what, what I would, how I'd summarize it as number one, I gotta, I gotta, you gotta get that, that, that base level of performance, basic grip, trigger, aiming, you know, that sort of thing. Right. And, and once we can, once we can get that, then you started talking about, self-awareness right and, and trying to open up the vision and the mind uh to what's taking place before you and understand what's taking place uh in real time uh and i would say that i think for a long time i uh i think i subconsciously was aware of certain things without really realizing I was aware of them, mm -hmm. but it's only been in, in recent, relatively recent history that I started to really understand, uh, and put more emphasis on being aware of the shooting process of, uh, the, of the shooting problem, whatever that is. Competition has been a big, a big part of that to help me, I think, understand and put that in a context that uh, makes sense yeah, for me. Competition makes you do the math in real time. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and you know, it, it's a common thing. You know, people, I think you even alluded to it earlier about how, uh, you know, a lot of times the shot timer, that, that beep or that buzzer goes and, you know, shooters joke about their mind going blank. Right. And, and I think, why I don't know if I can say that's really truly happened and that my mind's gone blank, but there's definitely those times where that beep goes and you maybe you're so amped up, you know, you're just so excited. Maybe you're just excited to be shooting. You know, that's that's one thing. Maybe what, you're uh maybe what you're happens overly, when the beep goes off, dude. What's that? What are you what are you saying? What do you do when the beep goes off? You hesitate or freeze or your head explode. I, I would say that in my, in my experience, like what I've experienced is at, at, at times, uh, not in recent history, but in my early days of competitive shooting, the beep would go off and maybe I'm already thinking about a different part of the stage that is, you know, that's challenging. It's the more, more difficult part of the stage. So you did so the you're, you're, you're thinking of that. You're focused on that. You're, you're maybe intimidated by that. So your mind, your focus is there instead of here right and, and and that's what i'm getting at is uh, developing that ability to be in the moment that right now the only thing that matters is this target that i need to shoot right now and how do i do that right i can't be thinking right. about that over there or this other thing that okay, well, check this out, man part of what you just described to me mm. uh flag in my mind is um uh, put more emphasis on remaining calm, controlling adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Adrenaline does that to your mind, dude. Okay. 
um, when I, when I, I call it feeling the jazz, when mm. I start feeling the jazz, um, and I recognize it, I immediately start just controlling my, uh, breathing, uh, you know, inhale through my nostrils, exhale out of my mouth. And I start I immediately, uh, when I start to feel the jazz, start to regulate my breathing and it helps me remain calm. Helps me, And then I've got the adrenaline to use to my advantage. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, maximum emphasis on, uh, remaining calm at all times, no matter yeah. what. I, I like how Can you touched on calm. that earlier. Cause I think that is, I think that's a huge aspect of performing under pressure is being able to remain calm. I've right. gotten a lot better at it for sure. Um, speaking of which, I think a, a interesting segue here, Dave. And so a question I would ask you is, right. uh, you know, I mean, you've undoubtedly been in some stressful moments or situations in your life, in your career, right. uh, critical moments, uh, how would you translate, say, everything we've talked about today about remaining calm when you're shooting a drill, remaining calm when you're shooting in a match? Uh, to it's the same thing. That, yeah, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's no difference. Mm -hmm. um, stress is stress. You know, depending on what your environment is. Uh, you know, I guess, you know, the cool thing about the human physiology is, uh, it's, it, it's fairly consistent, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Cause and effect on, uh, you know, adrenaline push, adrenaline surge. Um, I call it spikes, adrenaline spikes. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes I get it pretty hard. You know, I enjoy it. I I'm an adrenaline junkie from way back, but, um, fact of the matter is, you got to learn if you're going to perform under pressure on the high end of the scale, you've got to learn how to remain calm and, and control yeah. that. Yeah. And nobody's going to help you do it. It's something that you've got to understand early on and it just becomes a part of your daily regimen. I mean, you don't have to be geared up uh, and go into guns to put emphasis on remaining calm, that can be something you can do day in, day out, every moment of your life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But that ability allows you to think clearly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Here, here'd be a question I'd ask too, you know, as we're kind of winding down uh, earlier, we talked about uh, skill level performance, measured performance. W what are some, drills or tests or whatever that that you like to use or that you often shoot yourself to kind of just measure where you're at wow there's so many man um now throw out one or two yeah a few of my favorites uh combat speed bull that's a b8 25 yards everything's legit uh mount acquire and fire 10 rounds 10 second par time for score Got to have all 10 rounds in target to be able to score it anyway. Um, you can have 9X and one mic, and it's a fail. Uh, combat speed standard. This is another tough one. Um, same action. You're going to mount, acquire, and fire for 10 rounds and 10 seconds from the holster on an Ipsic silhouette, or you can use an IDPA as well, but you have to shoot it clean. All A's are down zero. Mm. Uh, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, the cyborg drill, it's a, a much more complicated drill, but it's, uh, something I worked up 20 plus years ago with a buddy of mine, Rob Seibel. And, um, uh, I use it as a unit of measure, uh, for my personal performance. Um, sometimes, you know, I was asked recently about what do I do to warm up? Well, I don't warm up, so to speak. Um, if you're going to measure your skill, you should fire the exercise cold. Well, okay, what is cold? If I fired yesterday, am I cold now? Do I have to wait a week? You know, whatever. Cold is cold. You know what I mean? I don't know. Um, but as a warm up, I've got a simple 30 round 
warm up. But I got to thinking about it when the guy asked me, what do you do to warm up? And I'm like, wow, dude, it's not like I do 100 jumping jacks and 50 push-ups or anything. You know, when you think about warming up, it's like stretching and calisthenics and whatever. But what am I warm actually warming up in a shooting sense? Well, uh, my physical interaction with the firearm, whatever it is, and my visual action in respect to uh, aiming. So I came up with a simple 30 round warm up. Um, I do a trigger finger isolation exercise. I fire five rounds right hand, five rounds left hand. Then I fire uh, right left hand alternating 10 rounds each. Um, and then uh, I fire 10 more rounds from the holster with a two hand grip. It's like as super aggressive as I can. Uh, mm -hmm. keep them on target. I use AC steel at 10 yards and, uh, and then I'm warmed up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because basically all I needed to do is spark up my eyes and, uh, you know, my mental and physical awareness. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of, you know, shooting, uh, whatever it is I want to work on. Mm. But I have noticed uh, I do need to get my eyes checked. Um, on that note, I encourage everybody, you know, to get your vision checked at least once a year. Um, I've had some weird visual things going on shooting wise. It's like uh, the gist of it is my point of aim, point of impact gun has become a six o'clock line of white hole gun. And I don't know if it's uh, if I've got something mechanical going on. Everything's working legit, but I'm wondering if my eyes might not have let go a little bit. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. um, but I got to get that figured out. But, you know, always, you know, stay on top of your vision. I take uh, Bausch and Loam Occuvite eye vitamins. I have for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'll be 60 this year and my eyes are still uh, 20, 40. That's really uh, good. And, I, and I've uh, noticed, I mean, you're still shooting iron sided guns uh, for the most part these days. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty much it. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say you're honestly quite blessed to have the vision you do at your age. I've been, uh, you I've know. been very fortunate, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, been super fortunate in a lot of respects. Mm -hmm. Very appreciative of just the simple fact that I've lived this long, you know <laughs> what I mean? But, uh, I certainly appreciate your time, the opportunity to, uh, you know, you have me on. Yeah. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I most certainly did. <laughs> uh, even true. though I kind of, it's a lot of working information, but it's all out there, man. Uh, yeah. I wish, uh, you know, you luck with your skill progression and dude, don't hesitate, man. If you want to ping something off me, hit me up. Yeah. You know, if you, there's something that uh, you think I can help you with or, you know, provide you with a different perspective, you know, feel free to get a hold of me. Absolutely, man. No, I appreciate it. Appreciate your time today as well. I'm sure you've given uh, our listeners and viewers a lot to think about. Uh, I suspect that there may be some viewing and watching that uh, may not even be quite ready uh, to, to receive or fully grasp some of the information discussed, but, but I, I would hope that it would uh, th that this topic of discussion today uh, kind of maybe because becomes that little seed in their mind that well hey you know this there's there's a place I can try to get to this is where you know I I see what these guys are talking about I don't totally understand or grasp it but you know that's that's where I want to be that's where I want to get to and hopefully that becomes right. some, and like, give them the motivation to find out yeah yeah exactly. absolutely man. Well, uh, Super Dave, uh, man, it's been great uh, chatting with you today and I appreciate you coming on the Concealed Carry Podcast, brother. Uh, we wish you uh, all the best of luck in, in your future endeavors and, uh, you know, everything you've got coming. So be Thank safe you out much. there. And yeah. So, folks, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, thanks for joining us for an another great episode of the Concealed Carry Podcast. Uh, we, we, you know, it's coming to the end of another week here. I know the, our schedule here on the podcast has been a little bit uh, all over the place. Uh, lots going on, and we're still trying to get moved into our our newly expanded office and warehouse. And 
and I've been, you know, traveling the country a little bit too. So appreciate your patience with us. We'll, we'll get back on a normal schedule before long. So with that, we're going to let you all go again. Uh, a special thanks to our man, super Dave Harrington, Dave, you know, before we sign on out of here, is there anything you want to throw out in terms of, is there a website, uh, contact info, yeah, yeah, anything like that? Um, on Facebook, it's just Dave Harrington. And uh, my website is uh, combatspeed.com, work in progress, but it's coming together nicely. Um, you know, I'd like to shout out to, uh, you know, my primary sponsors, uh, Bravo Company Manufacturing, uh, mm -hmm. Aimpoint, Wilson Combat, um, my, my supporters, you know, my industry supporter and friends uh, for whom I would not uh be possibly be where i'm at because of their help mm -hmm. and that's all i got man awesome Thank you, man all, all great care. companies i i would echo that you know so and i know many people that uh, are involved with the, those guys so uh it's good to know that you're tied within it with them as well so well folks we'll let you go we'll sign on out of here a reminder to train right train often and train safe so you can fight hard fight fast and fight true take care y'all